Now, uh, we've been talking about heavenly places, and last week we talked about angels, God's invisible agents. And we talked about that uh, God created angels, and there's a heavenly host that uh, you can't see in the natural. But in the spirit, the Bible clearly teaches that there are angels everywhere. There are angels in this room right now. Amen? And uh, I'm glad about that. What about you? Especially when I realize that one angel can slay an army of 185,000. Praise the Lord. I want about 10 like that around me. What about you? Amen. And so, you know, and so we talked about that. And um, today we're going to stay on the same subject of heavenly hosts. But today we're going to talk about demons, Satan's fallen angels. And uh, how many of you believe in demons? Let me see your hands. And, you know, more people believe in angels than they do in, in demons. And, uh, well, it, I can understand that. And as I told you last week, you know, I have really never personally encountered an angel. I've seen an angel. Some people say they have, and, and I believe them, but I personally haven't. But when it comes to demons, I, I, have to, I have to say that I believe I personally have seen the manifestation of them and have encountered them on more than one occasion. I remember the first time I was, a mission, I was on a mission trip in Haiti and uh, part of our trip, we went to see an orphanage and there was, uh, they were giving us a tour of the orphanage and showing us the work they were doing there. And uh, while we were walking around, one of the, the orphanage directors said, hey, could we pray for this child before y'all leave? And the child was laying on a the mat there and... Um, and, and the child was lifeless. And he said he's been sick for several days now, and, and we don't think he's going to make it, but, but can we pray for him? So we just got around the child. There was about three, four pastors there, and we laid hands over him, and we started praying for him. And I'm telling you, as soon as we started invoking the name of the Lord over that child, and the child was, I don't know, maybe six, eight years old, something like that, that child came alive and started slithering like a serpent and his tongue was darting out of his mouth just like a snake. I've never seen anything like it before or after. And man, I tell you what, our eyes got about that big and we started binding and loosening and all of a sudden the child just went limp and we finished praying and went about our business. A couple of days later, I asked the director, I said, how is that child you know, how's the child doing? And he said, man, after y'all prayed for him, a little while later, he said he was thirsty. We gave him something to drink and he got up, started running around and he's been fine ever since. Now, I'll tell you, you can't convince me that wasn't a demonic manifestation right there. You can call it what you want. You know, I was thinking about um, whenever I was a youth pastor, we had a family in our church and um, just a precious family and and uh, they had just gotten saved and they were just growing with the Lord. And they started experiencing like a weird presence in their house and just some things that just wasn't right. And they were just telling me about it. And, and, uh, and so we prayed and a few days later, they called me and said, man, it's gotten worse. Could you come over and pray over our house? So I said, sure. And, and I'm telling you, I went into that house and we began praying, and they had a crucifix up on the wall, and that crucifix started moving, but it was the only thing moving in that house. I mean, it gave me the free songs. But we, we took authority over it, and we just bound it up, and we commanded every evil spirit to be broken off of that house, and I'm telling you, that was the end of that. Oh, yeah, it was the end of that. I'm telling you, that family was happy about it. And then I was thinking about one more story, and, and then we're going to move on. But, you know, uh, back in, you know, when we were in the old auditorium and we were in during the week of prayer and fasting, and, and I did the prayer meeting that evening, and everybody had gone, and I was closing up the building, and I was getting ready to leave, and this car comes barreling into the parking lot like on two wheels. And they stopped, and, and uh, they jumped out and said, uh, do you work here? I said, yes, I do. So well, do you have any holy water? And I said, well, no, I don't. I said, what do you want? What do you need that for? They said, well, we've been having just uh, weird things going on in our house. Our children can't sleep. Doors are slamming. We can't take it anymore. We can't sleep at night. And uh, we thought maybe if we just bring some holy water in the house, it might get rid of that evil spirit in our house. 
So I said, well, I don't have any holy water, but I got a holy Bible. How about if I take that and we go over there and just pray? Oh, please come. So I got in my car and went over there and, and uh, I didn't know about it, but the whole neighborhood knew about it. And so uh, I guess they got word that, that uh, you know, the pastor was coming or something. And, man, they came out of nowhere to, to hear, you know, what was going to go on. And so I was like, oh, my Lord, what am I going to do now, you know? <laughs> and so I just started telling them. I said, listen, you know, uh, you know th- y'all believe in demon spirits? Oh, yeah, we do, yeah. So I said, well, listen, before I pray and ask the Lord to break that stuff, we don't want that demon to come in any of y'all. Y'all need to get saved. And they said, all right, and we're in favor. <laughs> And so we had an altar call there, but we took authority over whatever it was. And I'm telling you, that came to an end. And those children quit waking up at night being terrified and they stopped hearing all kind of noise in the house. Everything was fine. I believe in demonic activity and I believe there are demons here. What about you? You know, the Bible says that the origin, there's an origin of demonic spirits in Revelation chapter 12. It says there was a war in heaven. In Revelation 12 and 7, it says there was a war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to earth with all of his angels. Now, according to the passage of Scripture there, at some point in time, there was a war in heaven. And whenever this war in heaven took place, Michael and his angels waged war against Satan and his angels. And Satan lost the battle, and he was thrown out of heaven. And verse 4 tells us that one-third of the angels were thrown out of heaven because of Satan and the rebellion there. So those demonic forces are on the earth now. And the Bible tells us they, their purpose was to wage war against the Lord and against the Lord's children. The scripture says in verse 17, and the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony of Jesus. So as you can see there, Satan and his demons hate God and they hate his children. They hate us. And they want to inflict as much harm as possible on all of God's children. Are y'all hearing me out there? We're in a spiritual war, saints. We are in a spiritual war with spiritual beings called demons. Just like there's a heavenly host of angels, there's also a heavenly host of demons that want to inflict punishment on us. And we need to be aware of that. The Bible tells us that they're, they have a hierarchy, just like the angels of God have a hierarchy. You know, the, uh, Michael and Gabriel, they're the, you know, the, 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 the hierarchy of the angels, and there's angels underneath them. But, you know, Satan's angelic host is a counterfeit of what God does. How many of you know that? He can only counterfeit. He can only mimic what he sees God do. But Paul identifies these dark demonic forces in this way. In Ephesians 6, he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So first, he says, there's principalities. And and the principalities are the top ranking chief demons, I believe, that try to control and influence whole geographical areas, like even nations. 1 John 5, 19 says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Remember when Daniel was fasting and praying, we talked about that last week, and and uh, as he was praying, he encountered demonic interference where the answer to his prayer was slow in coming. And the Bible tells us that he was encountering a, a, a warfare in the heavens. And the scripture says in, in Daniel 10, 13, for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. And in verse 20, he says, I, I must soon return to fight the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And listen, and after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. 
So we get, a, we get a picture, a snapshot of what's happening in the heaven. And the Bible says that there was a demonic force, there was demonic interference, and there was a spiritual battle going on, and this angel of God was fighting against the spirit prince of Persia and the spirit prince of Greece. I mean, that's a picture, isn't it? And so you can see that these high-ranking demonic forces are trying to control an entire geographical area. The second in the line of demonic authority the Scripture talks about is powers and rulers of darkness. And, and these, are, I believe, are demonic spirits that execute the orders of the principalities that work under them. And then the third line of authority is the host of wickedness. And I believe these are the foot soldiers. I believe these are the, the, uh, the demonic spirits that, that are on mission to harass and to oppress and to possess and to control anyone and everyone they can. It's important that we know that. We know what we're dealing with. Because according to the scriptures, demons are affecting people throughout our society. Whether we realize it or whether we believe it or not, it's happening. It's going on. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, talking about Jesus, that he went about doing good and in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. He went about curing those who were oppressed of the devil. Up to that point, uh, the oppression of the enemy could rule and reign. When Jesus came on the scene, he put a stop to that, amen? Amen. And the word oppression means to, to uh, exploit, to dominate, to influence, and to control under his power. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to control people. And since the rebellion in heaven, when a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven, Satan has been trying to harass, to oppress anybody and everybody he can. And I don't want to be one of those. What about you? But the good news is that Jesus came to deliver us from that. That's the good news. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. The thief wants to steal. The thief wants to destroy. The thief wants to, to wreck our lives. But Jesus died on the cross to set us free from demonic oppression. Yeah. Amen? And so there's, there's numerous ways that demons affect our lives. I just want to talk about a few of them just to give us a picture. So we understand a little bit better how the enemy operates. Because listen, he will not show up at your doorstep with a Halloween costume on, a red suit with a pitchfork in his hand and some horns and say, I am Satan and I'm here to interrupt your life. How many of you know he doesn't work like that? The Bible says he disguises himself as an angel of light. So he won't tell you he's coming. He'll just show up. And the Bible says we need to be wise as serpents and gentle as done. We need to have spiritual discernment to know what we're dealing with out there. Amen? So we can win the battle successfully. But the first way demons try to influence people is through deception. And that's what Revelation 12, 9 says. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, he, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down on the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. He deceives the whole world. What is deception? It's whenever you believe a lie is truth. And when you believe wrong is right. And right is wrong. That's deception. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Remember whenever the Lord said you can eat of any tree except the one tree. You can't eat from that tree. And, and the serpent showed up. And you remember they bought into the deception of the enemy and they ate of the forbidden fruit and there was the fall of man. But when God approached Eve and said, hey, Eve, remember, you know, God said, if you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. The serpent said, you won't die. Was that the truth or was that a lie? We can read the story and know. But verse four says, the serpent said, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open, and as soon as you eat it, that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, 
and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Look at verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And this was her reply. The serpent deceived me. She replied. What did the serpent do? The serpent convinced her that right was wrong and wrong was right. The serpent convinced her that a lie was truth. And he convinced her to eat the forbidden fruit and got her, he got her in trouble. How does the, the, the demonic forces work today? The same way. They will try to make us believe that right is wrong and wrong is right. And they'll try to make us believe a lie is truth and a truth is a lie. He still works in the same way. Just like he led Eve through deception, he works today and he's making even church going people believe things that are ludicrous because he's a deceiver. And you and I need to be wise. We need to be discerning, amen? A second way the serpent works is demons influence people through the spirit of fear. And, and, you know, listen, we all deal with fear, but we don't recognize that sometimes fear is a demonic influence. When the apostle Paul was encouraging his son Timothy, his spiritual son Timothy, he told him that, he said, listen, be careful now. The enemy is going to try to get you into fear, but you need to guard against it. In 2 Timothy 1.7, he said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Now notice Paul called it a spirit of fear. It was a demonic influence. And Paul understood that Timothy was going to, he was going to be facing a demonic spirit of fear that would try to keep him from doing the will of God and the purpose of God. And he said, Timothy, that didn't come from God. That spirit of fear is from hell. Amen. And so God, the the, uh, enemy tries to put fear on all of us. The fear of man, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of dark, the fear of bad weather, all kinds of fear. The fear of the future, you name it. And sometimes we just succumb to it and we don't realize that what's fueling that fear is a demonic spirit. You know, you heard me tell the story, and I, I'm going to tell it again for those who didn't hear it so you can understand the gravity of what we're talking about. But I remember being gripped with fear. I, I experienced something tragic, and fear came on me, and I hated uh, to be alone at, at, at nighttime. I, I wanted to keep the lights on. Uh, I was afraid of death. I was afraid of, of, of anything to do with death and dying. And I worked in the oil field and I had to go to the warehouse in the middle of the night to get some equipment ready to go offshore. And you got this big old warehouse that, that, you know, there's all kind of creepy sounds in it and there's noise everywhere and, and surely robbers and thieves can hide anywhere in there. And I'm there in the middle of the night and I'm trying to open the gate and this fear is on me so bad that I was thinking about, I'm just gonna quit my job because I can't take this. And I remember just remembering That verse of scripture in Psalm 23, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And I was reminded that fear I was experiencing was not of God. It was the enemy. And I didn't have to submit to it. I didn't have to bow down to it, that it could be broken off my life. So right there, I said, in the name of Jesus, I break fear off my life. And man, that was the breakthrough. I opened that gate, went into the warehouse, got the equipment and went there many times after. And I just went in there in the spirit and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you the enemy. We'll try to put fear on you. That's the way he works. Amen? A third way that the enemy tries to harass God's people is through sickness. How many of you know that not every sickness is a physical problem? Doctors will tell you, sometimes they they deal with patients and they bring them through the battery of tests and they say, we can't find anything. Well, sometimes it's it's not a physical problem, it's a spiritual problem. In Luke 13, it tells us about the story of someone that had a sickness that the Lord said the problem wasn't physical, but spiritual. 
In verse 10, it says, On the Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, and he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. And she had been double over for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. Well, I bet she did praise God. I bet she did. She was sick for 18 years. And she couldn't get well. But in one experience with the Lord, the Lord, the Lord said it was a spirit. And he prayed for her. And all of a sudden, she was doubled over for 18 years. And the Lord delivered her in an instant, in a moment. And what am I saying? Listen, I'm not saying that everybody that is sick, that it's a demon. But I'm saying that everybody is sick. It's not necessarily a physical problem. Sometimes it's a spiritual problem. Amen? Are y'all receiving this today? So that's why you should pray. That's why you should, if you're sick, you should pray. If somebody's in your house that's sick, you should pray. Amen? Let's cover that base. Amen? Now, a fourth demon, a fourth way demons can work in people's lives is demons can influence us through depression. And in Isaiah 61, it's a prophetic word about what Jesus, who Jesus was and what he came to do. And the Bible says in Isaiah 61 and 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, a day of vengeance of God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, Give them, giving them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. And listen to this, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah said, Jesus came to deliver us from the spirit of heaviness. What is the spirit of heaviness? I don't know exactly, but I think it's like depression. It's discouragement. It's feeling hopeless. It's feeling helpless. I think that's what it is. Have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt discouraged because somebody who was harassing you, somebody was demonically influenced, trying to control your life? That, my friends, is straight from hell. And Jesus said, I came to deliver you. I came to deliver you from oppression. Amen. So remember when Elijah, he called down fire from heaven, burned up the sacrifice, man. He had a tremendous victory that day. And the Bible says right after he became depressed. In fact, the Bible says 1 Kings 19, and for a while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. This great man of God, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. This great man of God wanted to die. Are y'all hearing me out there? If this great man of God can get to the place where he was so discouraged and depressed that he wanted to die, then we, you and I can experience the same kind of thing. Amen? Now, again, I'm not saying that depression and discouragement is always spiritual. It can be an imbalance physically. But sometimes we start dealing with depression and discouragement and it's a demonic spirit that is trying to discourage you and trying to steal your joy. You need to know that. Listen, I have learned that whenever I start feeling discouraged, I start feeling down and out, that's an indication that I need to start warring in the spirit, that I need to start binding and loosen. I need to start taking authority over the oppression of the enemy in my life and break its power and break its hold off of my life so I can be set free with the joy of the Lord. Amen? Are y'all hearing me? Are y'all hearing me today? Listen, before I was a Christian, the enemy could just put that junk on me and I would just receive it. But as a child of God, you don't have to receive that anymore. The fifth way demons can influence people is through the root of bitterness. Now, of all the ways that Satan operates, I think this is the one that he's most successful at. In Ephesians 4.26, it says, Do not sin 
by letting anger control you. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Anger gives foothold to the devil. Notice that anger can open the door to demonic influence in your life. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God and lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble and by this many become defiled. So I think the way that it works is we get offended. We get hurt by other people. And it causes us to be angry. And when we get angry, if anger is not properly dealt with, through, through forgiveness, how many of you know if somebody offends you, you've got to forgive. But if you choose not to forgive, that anger, listen, can turn into a root of bitterness. And when bitterness takes root in your life, listen to me, it opens the door for demonic influence in your life. And listen, I tell you, of, of all the things that I've mentioned so far, this has to be the most obvious and the most common way I see people getting oppressed by the evil one. I've seen it over and over again. People that are just, they're in turmoil. They had no peace in their life. They're filled with anger. They're, they're, they're tormented in their mind. They're hearing voices. They can't sleep at night. They, they have no peace in their life. And as you talk to them, you find out somewhere, sometime, somebody did something to them and they're struggling to release them, to forgive them, and the enemy's got a foothold in their life. I'll never forget the dramatic experience I had one time on a, when we had Saturday night service in the old building and this lady came up for prayer and she said, I can't sleep anymore. She looked so ragged. So she looked, she looked like she had been just been up for days and living on the streets. And it was a, it was a terrible picture. And, and, and as I began to minister to her, I found out through just asking her questions that she had a spouse that had been unfaithful to her. Multiple times. It was an ex-husband. And she'd been so broken over it, so heartbroken over it, that she was struggling to forgive him. And that had opened the door. And so we began to minister to him and said, listen, don't forgive him for his sake. Forgive him for your sake. Forgive him for your sake so you can be healed and so you can move on. Don't let this guy ruin the rest of your life. And she chose that day to forgive him and release him. And the lady's life turned around. And I'm telling you, God works in powerful ways. He can break the power of evil in an instant. Amen? I tell you, it was, it was tremendous. And so I encourage you, don't let the enemy get a foothold in your life. In Acts 10.38, Speaking of Jesus, it says that he went about doing good and in particular, curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil. Jesus died on the cross to deliver us. And so what we need to know before we go home today is this. Jesus has given us power over demonic spirits. You know, I, I was telling uh, the congregation in the first service. As I was preparing for this, I heard a little voice. You don't want to talk about demons and devils because you're going to come under attack. Man, just get ready because no telling what's going to happen. Now, where do you think that came from? From God or from the devil? If, if, if I was the devil, would I want everybody to know how I work? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what we need to know is we don't have to live in fear of the evil one. As children of God, we have authority over the evil one. And I'm going to say that again because somebody in this room needs to know that. That as a child of God, he has given you power over the evil one. In Luke 10, 17, remember when Jesus sent out the disciples two by two to minister and, and at one time he sent 72 uh, out and they returned. The Bible says in verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Even the demons submit to us in your name. 
Verse 18, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. By the way, snakes and scorpions are representation of demonic forces in itself. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. And listen, nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. How many of you know demonic spirits have to submit to the children of God? Not because we're anything special, but because God has given us spiritual authority. Jesus has given us power over the enemy. And so if the enemy can make us fearful of him, if the enemy can make us intimidated and timid about the spiritual war we're in, then he can wreak havoc on us. But if we rise up in the power and the authority that Jesus has given us and put him under our feet where he belongs, then we can live in victory. Amen? Now, let me just suggest to you as we conclude, three ways to exercise power over the evil one. And the first one is this. Make sure you're a Christian. Make sure you're saved. Remember in verse 20, he said, listen, I'm glad that spirits are subject to you. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I could see you just overcoming the evil one. But listen, this is what you need to rejoice in, that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, in the book of life. You see, there's a book of life that Revelation talks about. It's the Lamb's book of life. And every time somebody crosses the line and with their own, the volition of their own will say, I want to be a Christian and ask the Lord to forgive their sins, the Bible says your name is recorded in the Lamb's book of life. It's kind of like the, you know, the the record. It's kind of like the roll call. And so I don't know, but I think whenever we die and get to heaven and, and you know, the angel said, Todd Menard, is he in that book? And the angel said, let's see, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I, I can't find him. Uh, I don't know if he's here. Oh, there he is right there. And all of a sudden, a smile will break out on my face. I praise the Lord. I'm in there. I'm in there. And he's going to say, enter into the joy of the Lord. But if my name's not in there, oh, 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 hell is hot. Amen. But he says, listen, you need to rejoice that your names are in the Lamb's book of life. And so I don't know. See, it doesn't record how many times we went to church. It records whenever we surrender our life to Jesus. And so the devil will be content with you just coming to church today, sir. He'll be content with you just showing up today, ma'am, as long as you don't cross the line. But as soon as you cross the line, all of a sudden, he can't do what he wants with your life anymore. His power has been broken. The Bible says you are delivered. You're transformed, transferred out of darkness and the influence of the evil one into his marvelous light. Amen? So that's the first step. But then after that, you got to live your life in submission to God. And this is what James says, submit yourselves to God and then resist the devil and he will flee. Listen, there's a a story in the book of Acts and these guys wanted to do warfare and and, and use their spiritual authority and and they lost their pants. And and the demon said, listen, we know about Paul, but who who do you think you are? And so we got to first submit ourselves to God. Because that's where the power comes. That's where the protection comes. That's that's where the anointing comes to live a victorious life over darkness. Are y'all with me out there? And so listen, the enemy is always trying to get you off base. He's always trying to get us out of the place of holiness, out of the place of righteousness. And what you need to know is demons like to feed on our flesh. Demons like to feed on our character. He will tempt us to do things that are ungodly and, and that are, that are un, uh, uh, unbecoming to God. And once he gets us out there, he gets his grip in our life. And listen, there's too many people that are going to church every day that are falling off because they're giving in to the deception of the enemy. And they're not submitting themselves to God. 
Are you all with me out there? See, it's not just good enough to be a Christian, saints. You got to live your life submitted to God. You got to live your life pressing in and pressing on with God. Amen? Amen? And then finally, you need to use your spiritual authority. You need to use your spiritual authority. Submit to God. Submit yourselves to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. And I think sometimes we just don't resist him. He comes along and says, I, I think I'm going to put some, a, a cloak of discouragement on you. And we just submit to it. I, I think I'm just going to come and put a whole bunch of fear and we just submit to it. How about we just start resisting that? Oh, no, you're not. You're not putting fear on me. You're not putting discouragement on me. You're not putting depression on me. You're not putting failure on me. You're not putting rejection on me. Come on, you're not making me feel like I'm a victim and that nobody loves me. You're not going to make me feel like the world's against me and nobody likes me. I'm not receiving that any longer. I'm resisting that in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen? Come on, stand with me as we close in prayer. Come on, how many of you received this this morning? Come on, let's take a moment right now. Let's just take a moment. Just, if you have the liberty, just live, re, raise your hands towards the Lord. You don't have to, but if you have the liberty, come on, let's submit ourselves to God for just a moment. And come on, let's, let's say, God, I submit to you today. I submit to you today. And I take authority. Come on, say it like you mean it. I take authority over all depression all deception, all sickness and fear. I break its power. I break the power of bitterness and jealousy and resentment and hatred. I break its power. I break its hold off my life, off my family. In the name of Jesus. Come on, say that with authority. In the name of Jesus, I declare I am free. In Jesus' name. Come on, say it again. I am free. In Jesus' name. Jesus has set me free. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, you have power. You have authority. Victory is yours. Amen. Now listen, one last thing before we go. Just bow your head with me for just a moment. You, they may be someone in here today that you're not certain that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've gone to church, you believe in God, you've prayed, but you've never really asked Jesus to forgive you and cross the line and say, Jesus, I want to be one of yours. And maybe today the Lord's saying, this is your day. This is your day. You've been struggling in life and I'm telling you the solution right now. You need to surrender to me and I'm going to turn your life around. If you're here today and you say, Todd, would you pray for me? I want to make sure that I'm a Christian and my name is in that book. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just raise your hand? There you go, ma'am. There you go, sir. Sir, right here. Anywhere else. Right here. Listen, those of you that are raising your hand, we're all believers in here. We're all family. Raise both of your hands. Raise both of you. Now listen, I want you to do something bold and we're going to put our foot on the neck of the enemy. If you got your hands raised, would you do me a favor? Slip right out of the pew and come up here at the altar right now. Just, just slip. There you go. Come on. Come on down. I'll tell you what. Right now, the enemy's power is being broken off your life. There you go. Come on down. There you go. Thank you, sir. Come on down. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. There you go. Come on. Come on. There. Thank you, Lord. Come on. The enemy's snatching souls out of darkness this morning. He's snatching souls out of darkness this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, just pray this prayer with me. Those of you that are up here, just, just from your heart. Listen, I can lead you in prayer. The only thing I can't do is mean it, okay? So you, it's got to be genuine from you. So just say these words. Come on down here, ma'am. Come on down here. Wow, there's some still coming. Come on down here. We're going to wait. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. Come on. Let's praise the Lord. Come on. Let's thank God. Come on now. Come on down. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Another soul snatched from hell. Another soul snatched from darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Let's pray together. Would you all just pray with us? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, for shedding your blood so my sins could be forgiven. I am sorry. I want, I want and need your forgiveness. Would you forgive me, Lord? Would you cleanse my heart? 
I submit my heart to you. I submit my life to you. Jesus, I want my name written in your book. I choose to give my allegiance to you. And I turn my back on the evil one. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord just a strong praise offering today. Yes, praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord. Now listen, isn't this beautiful? Now I want you to just turn around and look at everybody out there. This is your family. This is your family. Your family just grew by leaps and bounds. By leaps and bounds. Amen. Amen. You're not alone. You got a family. You're not by yourself. You got a family. Amen. Now listen, as you get back to your pew, there's a green card. I would encourage you to just fill it out. We have a gift for you. We have a Bible for you if you need one. We got some, just some information, some tools we want to put in your hand. Just come back up here as we dismiss or go into the lobby in the info center and they will have your gift for you. Thank you so much for being so courageous and brave and making that decision this morning. Amen. Come on, let's just give him, let's give the Lord praise one more time. Amen. Listen, if you need prayer for anything, we'll be up here. Let me just pray over you, Father. I pray the favor of God, the blessing of the Lord, the grace of God over the people of God today in the mighty and the strong name. What's his name, saints? Of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.